In order to avoid misunderstanding, I here add notes on two points arising out of the last chapter. One, one sensible critic wrote asking me why, if God wanted sons instead of toy soldiers, he did not beget many sons at the outset. Instead of first making toy soldiers and then bringing them to life by such a difficult and painful process. One part of the answer to this question is fairly easy. The other part is probably beyond all human knowledge. The easy part is this. The process of being turned from a creature into a son would not have been difficult or painful if the human race had not turned away from God centuries ago. They were able to do this because he gave them free will. He gave them free will because a world of mere automata could never love and therefore never know infinite happiness. Here Lewis addresses the classic problem of evil and suffering in the context of free will. He states that the transition from being toy soldiers, automatons, to being true sons of God is only painful because humanity fell from its original state of grace. The existence of free will is critical, as without it, genuine love, central to Christian theology, would be impossible. This makes us consider why God allows suffering. It is a byproduct of free will, which is necessary for true love and joy. The difficult part is this. All Christians are agreed that there is, in the full and original sense, only one Son of God. If we insist on asking, but could there have been many, we find ourselves in very deep water. Have the words, could have been, any sense at all when applied to God? Lewis acknowledges the limits of human understanding when discussing God's nature. He challenges us to think critically about the nature of God in existence, noting that applying could have been to God doesn't make sense. God, as the ultimate reality, simply is. Any speculation beyond this is deep water, a metaphor for concepts beyond human comprehension. You can say that one particular finite thing could have been different from what it is, because it would have been different if something else had been different, and the something else would have been different if some third thing had been different, and so on. The letters on this page would have been red if the printer had used red ink, and he would have used red ink if he had been instructed to, and so on. But when you're talking about God, i.e. about the rock bottom, irreducible fact, on which all other facts depend, it is nonsensical to ask if it could have been otherwise. It is what it is, and there's an end to the matter. Lewis's point here is that God, unlike created things, exists in a way that doesn't allow for alternatives. He is the source of everything, and to ask if he could have been different is a category mistake. This echoes classical, theological, and philosophical ideas, particularly from thinkers like Aquinas, that God is pure actuality without potentiality. The implications are vast. God is unchanging and eternal, while creation, including human beings, is contingent. But quite apart from this, I find a difficulty about the very idea of the Father begetting many sons from all eternity. In order to be many, they would have to be somehow different from one another. Two pennies have the same shape. How are they two? By occupying different places and containing different atoms. In other words, to think of them as different. We have had to bring in space and matter. In fact, we have had to bring in nature or the created universe. I can understand the distinction between the Father and the Son without bringing in space or matter, 
because the one begets and the other is begotten. The father's relation to the son is not the same as the son's relation to the father. But if there were several sons, they would all be related to one another and to the father in the same way. How would they differ from one another? One does not notice the difficulty at first, of course. One thinks one can form the idea of several sons. But when I think closely, I find that the idea seemed possible only because I was vaguely imagining them as human forms standing about together in some kind of space. In other words, though I pretended to be thinking about something that exists before any universe was made, I was really smuggling in the picture of a universe and putting that something inside it. When I stopped doing that, and still try to think of the father begetting many sons before all worlds, I find I'm not really thinking of anything. The idea fades away into mere words. Was nature, space, time and matter created precisely in order to make manyness possible? Is there perhaps no other way of getting many eternal spirits except by first making many natural creatures in a universe and then spiritualizing them? But of course, all this is guesswork too. The idea that the whole human race is, in a sense, one thing, one huge organism, like a tree, must not be confused with the idea that individual differences do not matter, or that real people, Tom, Nobby, and Kate, are somehow less important than collective things like classes, races, and so forth. Lewis shifts focus to the unity of humanity, comparing it to an organism. While we are all interconnected as parts of a single whole, this does not negate our individual uniqueness. Lewis warns against collectivism, where individual differences are erased, and also against individualism, where the collective is ignored. This is an important tension in Christian thought. Each person has a distinct role, yet we all share in the same human essence. Indeed, the two ideas are opposites. Things which are parts of a single organism may be very different from one another. Things which are not may be very alike. Six pennies are quite separate and very alike. My nose and my lungs are very different, but they are only alive at all because they are parts of my body and share its common life. Lewis uses a powerful analogy to make this point. Parts of a body are vastly different, but their difference is crucial for their function within the whole. Similarly, human beings have different roles and talents, but are united in a greater collective purpose. This analogy invites reflection on the diversity of the human experience within the unity of God's creation. Christianity thinks of human individuals not as mere members of a group or items in a list, but as organs in a body, different from one another, and each contributing what no other could. Lewis emphasizes the Christian view of individuals as distinct yet interdependent, much like organs in a body. The metaphor of the body is common in Christian theology, see 1 Corinthians 12, which describes the church as a body with Christ as the head. Each person's role is unique and vital, underscoring the importance of diversity within unity. When you find yourself wanting to turn your children or pupils or even your neighbors into people exactly like yourself, remember that God probably never meant them to be that. You and they are different organs intended to do different things. Here, Lewis challenges the human desire to make others conform to ourselves. He argues that this impulse goes against God's design for diversity. The uniqueness of each person reflects God's creativity and the richness of life. On the other hand, when you are tempted not to bother about someone else's troubles because they are no business of yours, 
Remember that though he is different from you, he is part of the same organism as you. If you forget that he belongs to the same organism as yourself, you will become an individualist. If you forget that he is a different organ from you, if you want to suppress differences and make people all alike, you will become a totalitarian. But a Christian must not be either a totalitarian or an individualist. Lewis presents two extremes, individualism and totalitarianism. Both are dangerous, according to Lewis, because they fail to recognize either the unity or diversity of humanity. A Christian must navigate between these extremes, appreciating both the collective nature of humanity and the uniqueness of individuals. I feel a strong desire to tell you, and I expect you feel a strong desire to tell me, which of these two errors is the worse? That is the devil getting at us. He always sends errors into the world in pairs, pairs of opposites. And he always encourages us to spend a lot of time thinking which is the worse. You see why, of course. He relies on your extra dislike of one error to draw you gradually into the opposite one. But do not let us be fooled. We have to keep our eyes on the goal and go straight through between both errors. We have no other concern than that with either of them. Lewis calls for a balanced approach, warning us not to get sidetracked by choosing between extremes. The goal is to follow Christ's example, appreciating both the individual and collective aspects of humanity. This final admonition is a call to avoid getting lost in debates and instead focus on living out the principles of the faith. 